Today I want to talk about Corruptor and how I beat Insane Roguelike difficulty with it. In the first part of the video I'll go over all of Corruptor's talents and in the second one I'll show you the character that I beat the game with and talk you through leveling, prodigies, gear and one of the most stressful final boss kills I've ever had. Corruptor is the warlock of Tales of Majeal. It's a long range caster class that first uses its dark magics to weaken their foes through hexes, curses and diseases to then unleash some of the most devastating, annihilating, brutal combos in the entire game. How brutal? Well, let's just say 10,000 damage is the low end of what late game Corruptor can pull off. The problem is, you need time to set up your combos and Corruptor is also one of the squishiest classes in the game, so combat is usually a race to who blows up first. This class is also one of my favorite sort of summoners, which will sound weird if you've ever tried Corruptor, because it does not have any summons. What it does have though is the ability to mind control. So when you enter a room, you can simply point at the strongest enemy and have him battle it out with all the other rares and uniques. This is really really fun and it never gets old. But let's take a step back and briefly talk about Vim, the resource you'll need to make all of this happen. Vim goes down as you use your talents, but it does not regenerate. Instead, you get Vim back by killing your enemies. The higher the rank of the enemy, the more Vim you get. And if you ever run out, you thankfully do not have to start hitting enemies with your staff, because you can use your own life to pay twice the Vim cost of a spell to cast it instead. But Corruptor has a pretty easy time keeping its Vim high, so you don't have to worry about this too much. You get plus 4 maximum Vim each level, and unlike most of the other resources, you cannot increase that maximum with stats like willpower. As we get into the talents, I first want to talk about domination hacks, because I consider this to be a core talent, and I will be referring to it as I talk about the rest of Corruptor. It is a single target arranged in hex that will mind control the target to fight for you. At 3 points you get 6 turns of mind control, which should be more than enough. If you use it, and the target is alone, it will just stand still, letting you safely put all of your debuffs on it. Successfully applying this is a key first part of your 10,000 plus damage combos, so let's go through how you do that. First, this checks your spell power against the enemy's spell safe. This is normal behavior for debuffs in Tome, but it's important to keep in mind. If they successfully save against your spell power, you will see an orange message in your lock saying they shrugged it off. Number two, you can never mind control enemies that have insta-kill immunity. This means dungeon bosses. The bosses that are the same every game, like for example the Minotaur in the maze or the Master in Dreadfell. Random bosses, which appear on insane difficulty, do not have insta-kill immunity. But of course, we are talking about Tales of Majeal, so there are some weird exceptions I found Celia and Vor are not instacle immune, so at least those two you actually can mind control. And then number three, cleanses and orcs. So ideally, the first spell you cast in combat, you want to be the domination hex. Oftentimes you can get it out before the enemies aggro to you, which will cause them to attack the mind control target instead of you. Unfortunately, in the late game of Tome, the majority of enemies you fight will be orcs. Orcs are a race with their own racial tree and their fourth talent is Pride of the Orcs. This is an instant speed debuff cleanse which the AI usually likes to use very quickly on the first couple of debuffs. So you would think the solution is don't open with the domination hex. Unfortunately it's not that easy. The hex breaks if you deal any damage to the hex target and you passively apply diseases with your spells which will break the hex. You also have a bunch of other talents that make it difficult to not damage the mind controlled enemy once combat begins, so if at all possible you really want to open with it. And how that will go I found to be extremely inconsistent. Sometimes you can mind control them and they will just stand there not using the cleanse. Sometimes they will cleanse the hex instantly and attack you. Sometimes they will cleanse the hex but continue fighting the enemies. I think this maybe happens if there's like a projectile mid-flight that 
immediately re aggros the hex target. Thankfully, at least for the most part, this is entirely specific to orcs. It is very rare for anything else to remove the hex from itself, even though other enemies do sometimes have cleanses. And despite all this, Domination Hex is still incredible. You'll be using this for every threatening, rare or unique to either safely apply your curses or make them kill each other. Also when the Hex falls off, if you are not in vision, the enemy will not aggro back to you, at least most of the time, so that can be situationally useful. So now that we know what Domination Hex is, let's go in order. Starting with S Drain. Unlike most of the other caster classes, Corruptor does not get a beam. It's all just projectiles and this is the one that you'll be using the most because this is actually the primary way you replenish your vim. You should immediately get this to 10 range so that you can always drain enemies and the projectile is fast enough that enemies will very rarely move before it hits. It's important to point out that this only replenishes your vim if you damage health of an enemy. If you damage their shield or if they somehow block the damage, it doesn't matter if the projectile dealt 2000 damage, you will get zero vim. So try not to do that. Bloodcasting passively makes you pay less life if you use it to cast your talents instead of vim. This is useless. There are no talents that synergize with casting spells with life instead of vim, so you are never going to do this on purpose. And while in the late game, anti-magic enemies can easily drain all of your vim, at that point you deal so much damage that you get it all back with a single drain. And worst case scenario, you just cast a few spells for the life cost. It's really not that big of a deal if it happens super rarely. Absorb life is a sustain that gives you more vim when you kill enemies, but it also has a vim degen baked into it, so you can't have it on all the time, but turning it on is instant speed, but it then also has a 30 turn cooldown. This seems worse than bloodcasting. Drain is really all you need, so I don't think this is ever worth it. Life tap is an unfortunate talent. It instant speed gives you a percentage lifesteal on all damage for two turns. This is not bad. With spell power this can get up to like 35% lifesteal, uh, which will heal you a lot in the late game. The problem is, this talent is very expensive since you have to first pay 2 points for useless talents. And since class points are always precious, it is very difficult to justify investing into this. In Vim, there is Blight Bolt, and this is where we get introduced to Crit Synergy, which is very prominent on Corruptor. You will want to be hitting 100% crit chance late game, but until then, you have Blight Bolt there to bridge the gap. It is your best single target burst damage talent. A cute trick you can do, because this is a slower moving projectile, is that if you cast it at maximum range, you will get to act again before the projectile hits the enemy. This is very useful with the Hex of Domination, as after you put your debuffs on the enemy, you then begin with a max range Blight Bolt, which lets you also cast Drain before the Hex breaks for maximum burst damage. Dark Portal is a teleport. The twist is, it lets you swap position with enemies, which then also applies a disease to them. This is surprisingly the highest damage disease you can apply, but that shouldn't pretty much ever be a consideration. You want to save this to either run away or reposition, so this only requires a single point and it's very good. Oh and um, this will swap places and apply the disease even to friendly targets. I managed to kill two of my escorts this way. Vimsense is track, but it aggroes every enemy that you'll see, which is pretty terrifying. The payoff is you will reduce their blight resistance and saves, which is useful, but Corruptor has other talents that can do this without aggroing every enemy. A reducing resistance is always good though, because it can go into negatives, so it's always a damage multiplier, but I don't think this is quite good enough. If you had 10, 20 extra class points, I think you would take Vimsense, but you don't. And Leech passively slightly improves your Vimsense, so you can guess what I think about it. 
In Plague, we start getting to the big bursty combos. Virulent disease passively applies diseases when you deal blight damage, and these deal damage of their own, and also severely reduce one of the target's physical stats. It is possible to apply all three of them, but this alone can't do it, since it has a 3 turn cooldown, so you need to use something like Dark Portal, which uses the same type of disease, although they don't necessarily deal the same amount of damage. Cyst Burst rewards you for stacking diseases, as it deals blood damage for each disease on the target. The fact that it spreads the diseases is usually not relevant, you have plenty of other AoE. So at uh, 2 diseases, this is a mediocre damage talent, not really worth the setup, and at 3 diseases, this becomes your best single target damage talent. So the question is, can you do that consistently? And from my experience, not really. And when you do land a bunch of diseases, there is one other button you want to press immediately before they cleanse any of them. Catalepsy. It only works on targets that already have a disease, and it does two things that don't really synergize with each other. You usually want to stun as soon as possible, to severely weaken your enemy before they deal damage to you, and on the other hand, Catalepsy also wants you to wait until you stack up a lot of diseases before blowing them all up for massive damage, which usually kills the enemy. This talent is also by far the coolest combo to do with Doom Elf's Pitiless, which prolongs enemy debuffs, your diseases, which then directly translates to tons of damage with Catalepsy. This is one of the two ways to deal 10,000 plus damage on Corruptor, so while it's not a good idea to rush into this talent, eventually this is very good. Epidemic is a fourth disease to add to your collection, it does great damage, it itself completely ignores disease immunity, and then massively reduces healing as well as disease immunity on the target, so that you can use the talents in this tree against any enemy. You definitely always want to have this up before you catalepsy. The two annoying parts of Epidemic is that it's only 8 range, and that you cannot apply this to friendly targets. So if something is mind controlled, Epidemic will unfortunately just fizzle. You first need to damage them with a different talent, and then apply Epidemic. In Blood, Blood Spray is your best AoE, as well as your best way to apply extra diseases. It goes up to 9 radius, so it's massive, but it's worth using even on single targets, so it's just a really good, simple talent. Blood Grasp is one of the very few talents in Corruptor's arsenal that actually make you tankier. It's a 10 range, extremely fast projectile that increases your maximum HP by 50% of the damage dealt and then heals you for 20% of the damage dealt. It's similar to Drain in that it directly scales with damage, so in the late game this can give you a lot of maximum HP and it's not a bad idea to send it at the weakest trash mob in sight, just to get as much out of this as possible. These three projectiles, Drain for resources, Blight Bolt for highest damage, and Blood Grasp for some survivability, are the foundations of Corruptor. You'll use these constantly. Blood Boil is the best talent ever that I ended up not using much. On paper, this is objectively an extremely powerful talent. It does need to consume a disease, but it's range 10, it deals good damage, even heals you a little, and slows by up to 70% for 5 turns. So how is it possible I didn't use it? Well, I really focused on catalepsy and trying to build up diseases for massive bursts of damage, and blood boil is just sort of awkward to fit into that plan, since it consumes one, which slows down your plan, and it just kind of feels bad to consume a full length fresh disease, which is what will usually happen. So basically I chose dopamine from bigger numbers that I did not really need over a 70% slow. Should you make that same choice? Eh, probably not. Blood Fury is a sustain that's here to help you hit that 100% critical chance for spells, and on top of that it even gives a sizable damage increase on crit, so not something you want to run very early, but eventually this gets very good. 
Continuing with that trend, in the Blight, there's Dark Ritual, which is a sustain that gives you crit multi. Big number good, hit hard yes, this goes great with Blood Fury later on. Corrupted Negation is the most dangerous talent on Corruptors in the hands of the AI, since it can remove magical or physical buffs, or any types of sustain. This makes it useful against every single enemy. You can use it to remove buffs, like blinding speed or greater weapon focus, or you can remove entire shields, or if the enemy is blocking for example, and you get to really ruin the day of certain classes like Doomed, where you can strip their shadow sustain, which is like 50% of that class, or Brawler, which especially brings me great satisfaction by stripping their striking stance. Get two points here quickly and squeeze in two more if you ever get the chance. Corrosive Worm is a fun talent that applies a debuff for six turns that reduces the target's blight and acid resistances and at the end of the duration it will explode for a percentage of all damage you dealt during those six turns. This percentage scales with spell power and you can expect it to get above 50% late game. This is the other way you can deal 10,000 plus damage on Corruptor. I hit Elandar with this for 20,000 damage, and when I say hit, I mean he blocked all of it with Phantasmal Shield. Yeah, that's painful to look at. Anyways, this is a death timer for enemies. They will die once it explodes if you are damaging them for those 6 turns. Now obviously, 6 turns can be pretty long, especially for a squishy class like Corruptor, but if you can manage to domination hex an enemy, you can put Corrosive Worm on alongside a few of your curses and then open up on the enemy with Corrosive Worm on only like 3 or 4 turns until exploding, which is more than enough. Poison Storm is a radius 4 AoE centered on you that does a lot of blight damage and applies one of 3 poisons, of which the last two are very very good. Don't be confused by it saying talent level 6, what that means is the effective talent level, which is the amount of points you put in times the tree mastery, which is 1.3 in this case, so 5 times 1.3 means you get 6.5 effective talent level at 5 points. How good this talent is, is pretty simple and it depends on your playstyle. If your corruptor stays in range 4 of enemies, it's amazing. My corruptor did his best to stay at range 10 though, so I had no use for this. Bone is a tree that every single corruptor build should take and it's about dealing physical damage. Bone Spear is a piercing projectile that does physical damage in a line, increased by the amount of magical debuffs on enemies, up to doubling its damage at 5 debuffs. You will not be focusing on physical damage increases on Corruptor, but this talent is very relevant in the early to mid game, because with 3 plus debuffs it just really, really hurts, even on a single point. Eventually it gets outscaled by your black damage increases, but definitely don't ignore this talent just because it does physical damage. Bone Grab lets you teleport adjacent enemies away from you and then pin them. This is very good when it works. The problem with this talent is that it's extremely dangerous to use. As a squishy ranged character, you don't really ever want to spend a single turn standing next to melee enemies. If Bone Grab fails, that is exactly what's going to happen. So it's always pretty scary to use this if the enemy next to you is like a rogue marauder unique and you don't have 20 higher spell power than their spell save, which should give you a 100% chance to beat their save, but on this Wikipedia from 2012 it says you sometimes always have a 5% chance to fail anyways, so who knows. Either way, if you can run or teleport away instead, you should consider it because you are extremely frail. Bone Spike passively fires a projectile at enemies with 3 plus magical debuffs each turn. It does pitiful damage, but I think it can proc things like Life Drinker, that has a 15% chance on spell hit to fire Blood Grasp, so it's better than nothing. And finally, 
the reason why you rush this category with your very first category point, Bone Shield. This is really the only reliable defensive talent of Corruptor. It's sort of like a Storm Shield rune, but as a sustain, each Bone Shield stack entirely blocks one damage instance above a certain threshold. This makes it very easy to know if you are in danger while playing Corruptor, you simply ask yourself, is your Bone Shield up? Then you're fine. Is it down? Or like one out of four charges? Get out now. It's very easy to get overconfident because you're not taking any damage, you're not taking any damage, oh, you just died because your Bone Shield went down. It's pretty much exactly how I died on my first Corruptor, and it was such a perfect example of what you should not do, but I unfortunately managed to delete the video of it when I was sorting out my recordings, so you'll just have to trust me. Bone Shield is best at blocking single instances of massive damage. This means most spells or mind powers, stuff like beams, big AoE explosions, it takes those kind of talents multiple turns to get through your Bone Shield. What Bone Shield is bad at blocking is many instances of high damage, so basically any weapon class. Talents like Flurry can take you to zero Bone Shields and half health in a single action. Like I said, you usually don't want to stand next to melee enemies on range characters, but doubly so on Corruptor, don't let them just eat your Bone Shield for free. It's also important to play around the fact that you recharge one Bone Shield stack every four turns. Kiting back in tough fights and playing it slow is always good, but even more important on Corruptor. You also want to try to run as many sustains as possible, so that if something tries to strip your sustains, it has a lower chance to hit Bone Shield. So max this as soon as possible. The next locked category is Shadow Flame. Ray form removes your need to breathe and lets you walk through walls. This is a situationally useful talent, and it works well with a movement infusion, but I think I used it exactly once in my run, although it was pretty impactful since it let me get away from a dangerous enemy. So for a point, it's pretty good. Just make sure you are not in a wall when it ends, the random teleport could be really dangerous. Dark fire does fire and darkness damage in an AoE. On Corruptor, this is only ever useful when you run into enemies with a 100% blight resistance, so worm that walks, but even then you have other non-blight talents to use, or you can just reduce their blight resistance and slowly grind them down, so this is not very useful. Flame of Ururok is why you should consider this category. It's a sustain that makes you a demon, gives you a bit of resistance, and more importantly, global speed. But it is disgustingly expensive at 90 vim, and honestly, the amount of global speed is pretty low. Still, even this little bit is quite noticeable as you play, so I think this is worth it. You don't really have anywhere else to put the category points anyways, unless you pick up an escort tree. Fearscape teleports you and an enemy to hell, where demons get healed, which is you, since you'll be running Flame of Ururok, and everything else takes damage each turn. Unfortunately, you cannot stay there forever, as it slowly drains more and more vim, the longer it is sustained. This should generally not be used to 1v1 powerful enemies, you don't want to be stuck with them in a small area, instead you use it on trash mobs that can't ever harm you, so that you can heal up and cool down all of your talents. So it's definitely worth a point. On the generic side, there's Torment. Willful Tormentor passively increases your maximum whim. This is useful throughout the game. As you pick up new sustains, you want to invest some points into this and eventually max it. Especially if you get Flame of Ururok, you'll need this to counteract that 90 whim price. Bloodlock applies an instant speed debuff that makes the targets unable to heal above their current life. This sounds more useful than it actually is. You have healing reduction baked into Epidemic if you really want it, and you just deal a lot of damage, so it's hard for enemies to outheal you. Overkill solves all your AoE problems by letting you simply deal a lot of single target damage, which will then splash out in a small radius when the target dies. 
this is very satisfying to watch as it causes sort of chain reactions where if one enemy dies they all do. One point is enough though as this mostly just helps you clear trash. Blood Vengeance is a sustain that does nothing. You still want to put a point in it and run it of course to protect your bone shield but I didn't notice this having an effect once in my 1.5 runs on Corruptor. Sure it could potentially save you but these types of talents that rely on you taking big damage are usually not great since you do your best to avoid that and on Corruptor you have bone shield so it's even worse. Hexes are all long lasting debuffs starting with pacification hex that dazes the target on application which makes you unable to move and halves your damage, saves, defense and powers basically just makes you useless but it also breaks on any damage taken. This is extremely annoying when it gets applied to you because you're kind of skipping your turn unless you cleanse it and if you've used something like psionic torque which gives you flat damage reduction you might even block all incoming damage so the daze doesn't get removed. Also the AI can have this at a much higher effective talent level than you because of the difficulty scaling so it can get the daze reapplied more consistently. With a 100 spell power you can only get this to 50% daze reapplication at 5 points. Still on paper that feels like it should be really good but it just didn't perform that well for me. Corruptor already has a bunch of utility spells that all take a full turn to use that do zero damage and the more of them you use in combat the worse it feels. It's really best used around walls since it's a small AoE. Burning Hex increases the cooldown of any talent used while hexed. If you don't cleanse this against Argoniel this can just completely lock you out of playing the game on casters but I consider this pretty unimpactful when used against the AI as your burning hex never gets as powerful and enemies usually have more talents than you. But I decided to try it out, I put 5 points into it, used it against the final boss and I don't know, I guess it did things, I didn't really notice any difference like the boss not using its talents and only auto attacking so it's possible I'm just blind to how good this is but I don't like this talent. Empathic Hex makes the Hex target damage itself for a percentage of all damage it deals. This is another one that's way more powerful used against you than by you. Unless things go really really bad this shouldn't ever out damage just you hitting enemies with your spells during that turn that you would cast Empathic Hex. I guess another edge case use you could say is using this once you mind control an enemy to make it kill itself by damaging other mobs but that's not needed. Most of the time they kill themselves anyways by just attacking the other rares. And Domination Hex I already talked about at the very start. I'll just mention that this one would also be much stronger in the hands of the AI but fortunately it is forbidden for the AI to use this talent. And the final piece of the biggest burst combos, Curses. Curse of Defenselessness reduces saves which makes it so that it's much harder to run into an enemy that has such a high spell save that you can't apply any of your debuffs which feels really bad on Corruptor. This itself ignores spell save so it always applies and I felt like one or two points are enough. Curse of Impotence reduces damage dealt which I like but here again I run into the problem of too many full turn taking non damage talents so I basically never use this. It doesn't even scale that well. Curse of Death deals all right darkness damage over time and prevents normal health regeneration which doesn't mean it actually stops healing. The best use for this is for the few 100% blight resistant targets but I don't think it's worth more than a point. But this tree is redeemed by Curse of Vulnerability which reduces all enemy resistances. Like I said reduces can go into negatives and together with Corrosive Worm you can make some enemies have like negative 90% blight resistance which makes them take a lot more damage. So just think of this as a damage multiplier. 
This is the perfect curse to use after Domination Hex, if you go Curse of Vulnerability, into Corrosive Worm, into Big Burst, things just die. Don't think you can just ignore Resistance Penetration because of this talent though, since it can get cleansed, it's only single target, so you definitely want to still have Blight Resistance Penetration. And Survival, you should pretty much never unlock, I would rather put a category point into one of the already unlocked categories, because you can get track through either escorts or on gear, and the rest of the talents are not important. So here's my guy, straight from the final boss, and as always, for full transparency's sake, these are the items that I use, none of them affect gameplay, they mostly just change up the UI a little bit, and if you are new to the game, just stick to vanilla until one of these things pisses you off and you want to fix them. I have again uploaded my entire playthrough of High Peak and the final boss without any commentary, just if you want to see how the class plays. Originally, I was going to have my kind of walkthrough of the Elendar fight here, but I just now recorded it and it's over half an hour long, so I'm going to instead upload it as a separate video, so if you are interested in that, it will be linked in the description. And now let's continue talking about Corruptor. For your stats, it's the usual mage distribution. You put everything into magic, which makes everything you do better, and you need it to unlock your spells. And then, well it's actually not like every other mage, because you do not need willpower, since it does not increase your resource. Vim does not get increased by willpower. You do get more Vim per enemy killed. It gives you 50% of willpower, plus then it gives you Vim based on the rank. But since you have Drain, you never have to worry about it, so don't put any points into willpower. Now I have quite a lot of willpower because of random modifiers on gear, but it should never be a priority. So instead you put your second points into Cunning, since Crit is quite important for Corruptor. You have a bunch of talents supporting this, and you have talents that directly scale and improve from damage, like Blood Grasp and Drain. So the harder you hit, the better these talents are, so Cunning is a no-brainer. Then you have a bit of a choice between Constitution and Dexterity. Dexterity you would take for some defense and for shrugging off criticals. Constitution you just take for a bit of life and a bit of healing modifier. I decided to take Con first just to have some amount of a buffer once the bone shield goes down and then the rest of the points I put into dexterity. But this could realistically be swapped and for my race I chose Doom Elf. This is from the Urrock DLC and it is the most annoying unlock in the entire game. It requires you to kill like three different demons that one of them has a only a percentage chance to spawn in your run and it requires you to clear Dark Crypt. So what I recommend doing and how I did this unlock is play a Berserker or some really you know stupid brute force simple class that just hits hard, uh, put it on the easiest difficulty that gives you an infinite amount of lives, put on like a podcast or something and just bump into enemies, press your stunning blow and rush through the game as fast as possible. There's a forum post where originally some people went over this, you know, I guess strategy uh, that I'll link in the description if I find it. And this is a really fun race for this build and for this class because of Pitiless. But first uh, you have Haste of the Doomed. This is an instant speed teleport that you can activate again in the same turn uh, for the same teleport, the same distance, but this time it will actually take a turn. So it's just extremely useful, gives you a lot of mobility, and you can use it, even though it's a spell, you can use it when you are silenced, or even when you are pinned. Basically you can always use this. Why does it work this way? I don't know. It just does. So usually this is why you pick Doom Elf, as this is an incredibly useful talent the entire game. But the rest of the talents are definitely not bad. Resilience of the Doomed passively gives enemies lower critical multiplier, but uh, as far as I understand this, so what this does is it increases your crit shrug off. And the tooltip for crit shrug off says something else. It says it gives you a chance to completely ignore bonus critical damage. So if it hits this 50%, it's as if the attack did not crit. It's just a little confusing, especially because this has been changed in the past. 
and they are still not uh, exactly clear. So that's very good. Corruption of the Doomed is sort of whatever. The best part about this is that it's a magical sustain that is completely free, so it helps protect Bone Shield against any sustain strips. And then Pitiless is the second huge reason for why this race is very useful with Corruptor, because it lets you massively increase the damage from Catalepsy. Usually as you are casting this, your Epidemic and your Diseases will have like 4, 5 turns of duration, so this will usually double the damage of Catalepsy, at least. So it's just a very nice combo. If you like seeing really big numbers, this is the race to pick. If you can't or don't want to do Doom Elf, you can definitely go Shalor. Uh, Shalor is probably just better because of the huge burst of global speed and timeless. I think those two races clearly stand above the rest for this class. As for the talents, the goal was to get the biggest possible explosions from Corrosive Worm and Catalepsy. So I made sure to max all of these talents that give you as much crit multi, as much crit chance and damage increases, even though often these last few points are not very efficient. Like here, last point in Catalepsy gives you 6% extra damage, last Blood Fury point 3% extra damage. So you could definitely leave a few of these talents on 4 points and get something like Blood Boil, which is a very good talent, or possibly opt for Poison Storm for example. So just keep in mind this is built for maximum dopamine, not perhaps the best possible min-maxing. And unfortunately as you level, you will have to wait for the dopamine for quite a long time, because these combos require quite a lot of points invested, and you can't really afford to just go straight for them. So first you need to kind of beef up the core of your character, get your projectiles a couple points, get the blood spray so you get some AoE, and all this takes a while, so you can only expect to start doing these combos like close to your first Prodigy and then beyond. And at the first I just went for Corrosive Worm, because Corrosive Worm just sort of works by itself. Uh, you can just Corrosive Worm and then spam your projectiles, whereas Catalepsy requires everything else, right? You want a high Epidemic damage, you want the Virulent Disease to deal damage, and then you want points in Catalepsy, so it's by far the most expensive so I only went for that at the very end of the leveling process. On the generic side, you have a lot of space to experiment. I am still not convinced that Burning Hex is all that good. If you manage to destroy Zigger, which you do by assisting the Grand Corruptor from Spellblaze, you will get 0.2 extra master in Hexes. It is not very impactful, but you know, it's a nice bonus. Unfortunately for me, I failed to do this, which I can't remember the last time I failed this quest, because usually the Grand Corruptor can almost win the fight by himself, but this time he died extremely quickly, at least I managed to avenge him afterwards, but that means he did not give me his reward. For the Prodigies, I got Ethereal Form at level 25, I just love this Prodigy, I think it's just so good. For me, this is like Adept. When everyone describes Adept, I feel like that's what Ethereal Form is. It just kind of makes your character a little better across the board, since it gives you damage penetration, which you usually don't have capped at the point you take Ethereal Form. It gives you absolute damage resistance, which is separate from your usual resistances. It's just an extra resistance that is applied after your usual resistances. So it increases your damage, makes you tankier, and then it obviously gives you a big increase in defense, which will make it so that you can dodge the attacks of non-rogue enemies for the most part, even with no other support from your gear. I have basically no defense on my gear, and I have 76 defense. That's not high if I was really relying on this for my defenses, but as just a throwaway extra layer of defense, I think it's pretty good. Then for my second prodigy, I needed another defensive one, as I felt damage was not really going to be a problem. I was going to consider Corrupted Shell, but since I failed the quest to destroy Zigger, this wasn't even an option, and I think even if it was an option, I would still ultimately end up going for Draconic Veil. This prodigy just feels incredible. The only downside is that you have to remember to use it, 
but what I often did is that as I would get into combat, I would get debuffed because I would forget about turning this on, but that's why you have your Shatter Afflictions. So you use Shatter Afflictions on the first debuff, if it's something that you need to cleanse, and then you turn on Draconic Will. Obviously this is not optimal use of your Shatter Afflictions, but it works as a reminder that you have this Prodigy, or you can obviously autocast it when enemies are visible, but then you might lose on like a turn or two of it being up, which I find worse than just using the Shatter Afflictions. Other options I considered, I looked at Eye of the Tiger, because there is usually like a downtime of a few turns where you don't have any of your good talents up, and since you are going to reach 100% spell crit, Eye of the Tiger will perform well, but it helps with offense, doesn't help with defense, so ultimately I decided against it. At Adept, I'll just briefly mention it since it's really popular, I again didn't really find that it does anything special, it does not give you an extra bone shield, at least by itself. I read in some old written guide that apparently if you take Adept and then you get one of the necklaces that increase the mastery of a random tree, and that random tree happens to be bone, then you might get an extra bone shield, which seems like a lot of work. I don't think Adept is great for this class. And the last one I want to mention is Aether Permeation. I talked a lot about the importance of protecting your bone shield, which is the sole purpose of this prodigy, to protect your sustains, but I think the opportunity cost is simply too high. You already have like 9 magical sustains, so it is already pretty hard to hit bone shield, and the 40 spell power just unfortunately isn't enough. On Corruptor you would deal blight damage, and with this damage type, more so than with the other ones, you will run into enemies that are extremely resistant and sometimes even have affinity. So one example of that would be if you have the Eldritch DLC, Rising One has Worm That Walks as a permanent summon, which has very high blight immunity, so he's kind of annoying to deal with. But then especially you can find Worm That Walks in Vaults, and those are usually pretty dangerous. On Corruptor, these are even harder, so don't feel bad about skipping those. The loot in them is like never worth it, you're never really going to find an upgrade in there. I mean, you'll recognize them, because as you enter it there will be worms, so if you see that, just leave. Another class that is pretty difficult to deal with is Sun Paladin, surprisingly, but Sun Paladins often have a really high spell save, which can make them a pain to deal with. Especially if they are on a unique, coupled with an actually powerful damage class. So don't be afraid to skip those type of enemies. Uh, this is that type of class where you can definitely expect dips in power. So you should not expect to kill every single enemy you find. And then the other very common example is Reavers, which have access to infestation which gives a high amount of blight resistance and blight affinity. So for these enemies ideally you want to hit them with the corrupted negation and remove those effects, or eventually hit them with the rune dissipation, which is a flawless segue into the inscriptions. I ran a movement as always, this one is unfortunately pretty weak, only 700 increased movement speed, not the most impressive for late game, but then my setup sort of changed between the early game and then later on once I got Draconic Will. The big consideration is whether or not you want to run a wild mental infusion, which lets you cleanse silences. Usually this is very important on mage type classes, since if you get silenced, you can't defend yourself. And this is true for Corruptor as well, you won't be able to use any of your talents, but you will still be able to use Haze of the Doomed, which together with the movement infusion should be able to get you out of basically any situation and wait out the silence. So I wouldn't say it's mandatory, especially before you get stun immunity, a physical wild uh, will likely still perform better for you. And then after Draconic Will, after Relentless Pursuit, and just because I really wanted both Reflection Shield and the Healing Confusion, uh, I replaced the wild mental one and I even managed to get pretty high silence immunity, 78%, so I stayed with these four. The final one is Rune Dissipation. I played around with the idea of not taking it because of Corrupted Negation, 
but the truth is it's just stripping four or possibly five if I put an extra point here. That's not really enough, so room dissipation is still useful. A question you might have is why don't I use the other curses or hexes during the domination hex since there is still time? And that's mostly because I am lazy. Since I didn't put many points into them, it just felt very little impact and uh, any enemy that is unable to cleanse vulnerability corrosive worm into the double projectiles, or even if you don't get the double projectiles, if you can't get to 10 range, basically curse of vulnerability into corrosive worm. If these two debuffs stick, you don't need anything else, you've already won. But if you have the patience for it, you definitely can apply a couple extra hexes or curses. Obviously then the biggest problem are orcs, which I mentioned at the beginning of the video when talking about domination hex, and yeah, you can try and bait out their debuff removal, but they can definitely be frustrating to fight. At the same time, the orc prides are some of the most fun you can get out of domination hex, because if you apply it to some of the random bosses or super overturned uniques, they can do some serious damage to anything they come across. For example, Rakshor, I killed without ever doing any damage to him myself, purely through domination hexes. For the items you are looking for, increased blight damage, increased critical spell chance, crit multi, and in terms of defenses, immunities, and resistance, wherever you can pick it up. I've lately become pretty addicted to this all resistance modifier on the helmets, I just always seem to end up with it. I think I spent like 5000 gold trying to roll a decent amulet and this is the best that I could come up with. Just topping off my stun immunity and a bit of blind immunity since I almost managed to get that to 100% with 85, which feels really good. Blind is not a fun debuff. On your cloak you should look to get some crit multi. Cloaks have a few really good crit multiplier modifiers. Gloves are a great place to pick up a lot of crit chance with the war making modifier that alone as you can see here these gloves basically mostly only have that my belt is a tier 3 belt that i found in like one of the tier 1 dungeons i think even and it gives me a bit of crit multi some blight resistance penetration and 10 spell power the shield active i used in the early game a little bit but now i don't because it has the same cooldown as my torque I also spent like 4000 gold trying to roll a better belt. This is the best that I could roll with my leftover gold. As you can see it is really awful. It provides basically no good stats. Nothing better than that 20% resistance penetration. Which, oh yeah I don't think I mentioned, you still want a resistance penetration. I only got to 55%, usually you definitely want 70 and uh, even on this character you want 70. Uh, the all damage penetration is already counted into this number, so you should not put these together. Just like with resistances, it's already counted into it. So again, here this 38%, you don't do 41 plus 38, you don't have to do any math, it's already added together. Oh yeah, and spell power, that's also something that I didn't mention. You need spell power. If you've seen the final boss video that I uploaded, I yet again underestimated my spell power. I always feel like it's fine, but then the bosses resisted a few of my spells throughout the fight, so try and get to that 100 spell power as close as possible. Now I have spell power on crit, so after I crit twice I have 95 spell power, which ended up being enough, but this should never be underestimated, as it's the easiest way to throw your run. If you get into the final boss and you realize you can't apply your debuffs, you're just going to die. There's not much you can do at that point. Uh, you will still deal damage with your talents, but if you can't apply your debuffs, Corruptor is much much weaker. On your boots, as per usual, you want the Undertired mod, that gives you the Silence, Confusion and Stun Immunity. I got a ridiculous Psionic Shield. This might be the most powerful one I've ever had. 300 flat damage reduction is just nuts. You can't die while this is active. My lantern is my first piece of actually good gear, it fulfills all my light requirements, gives me a bunch of immunities, even crit multi, and a bunch of defense on top to help out with that a little bit. 
on your ranks you want to aim for the lesser modifiers, right? There are greater ones and the lesser ones. And the lesser ones actually give immunities, which is often what you want on your ranks, because it gives up to 50% if you hit the maximum roll. So this rank is very nice, giving me spell power, damage and two important immunities. On my Wheel of Fate I decided to keep this. Ultimately I had a pretty comparably good rank, but what this one has is the big HP regeneration. And health regeneration is pretty useful on Corruptor, because you are basically never on full life, because of Blood Grasp that gives you a lot of maximum life, but doesn't heal you for the full amount. So if you have life regeneration, it will be constantly ticking, constantly giving you that life, even when you have your shields up. So if you can pick up a bit of LHP regen on your gear, I think it's quite useful. A rope is pretty usual, bunch of damage, plenty of resistances. This is why you take ropes, because no other armor type can really give you all of this at the same time, at least for mages. And then the weapons are interesting. Your ideal late game setup is one-handed staff with life drinker. This is obviously a unique, so you have to get a little lucky to have it drop, but it is quite common. And it's good because it gives decent stats, plus 15% to fire a blood grasp on spell hit. And it will be very difficult to find a better offhand, so your options are daggers or mind stars. As an example, since I did not find Life Drinker for a while, this is kind of the best that you would expect from a normal dagger, just some crit multi. Here the annoying part is that it requires 48 dexterity, so what you would need to do is find gear that gives you enough dexterity, then you put on the dagger, and then you can get below 48 dexterity and you will keep the weapon. As long as you don't unequip it, it will give you its stats. But it's just annoying to kind of manage your gear like that. It's already annoying to do this for like prodigies or thick skin. So honestly, until Life Drinker, I would just use a two-handed stuff. And I almost, almost managed to roll this stuff. Look at this beauty. It's absolutely fucking nuts. Unfortunately, I ran out of gold before I rolled the one-handed modifier. So I just kept it to look at it. Look how beautiful it is and imagine it being one-handed, but it wasn't meant to be. So instead I have this one, which is still pretty damn good. There are two one-handed staff modifiers. One of them is greater, one of them is a regular modifier. And don't be discouraged if you don't find a one-handed staff for a while. Uh, I think I only transitioned to this setup after I came back from the east and I got to the font of sacrifice. Honestly, just using a good two-handed staff you won't be missing out on that much. I also got this black rope and uh, I really wanted to make it work because it would be very thematic. It seems specifically suited for a corruptor. It also looks cool, giving you this black look. But unfortunately in the end, just the amount of resistances that I get with this and it's even just better offensively because of the spell power and the damage mod and the resistance penetration. So in the end I couldn't justify it, which is a shame. For the escorts, your priority is magic if you can pick it up, but then also don't be afraid to pick up something like Premonition from Sears. This is a magical sustain and it gives you extra resistances. The downside is that it gives you mana, which means that anti-magic enemies will get more powerful against you, because when they drain it from you, they will deal damage, mana burn damage to you. So there is a downside to this, but I think Premonition is just a really good talent, so I usually do this anyways. And then you are also looking for a track, because you need it either on your gear or from an escort, so hopefully you get it from an escort. And then also if you get a Sun Paladin, a chant of Fortress or Fortitude will be very good. I've reached a point where I basically always take Fortress, even if I don't use armor, because purely for the physical damage resistance, that is just always useful. For the elixirs, you definitely want class points first, and then you could even consider the 4% spell crit elixir before generic points, as I found not to have much use for the last few generic points, and after that the rest of the elixirs are not too important. I really enjoyed playing Corruptor. It is 
quite a different playstyle from all the other classes. Usually when you have a glass cannon, you know, something like Arcane Blade, it means, sure, you don't have much defense, but the cannon part of that comes in basically instantly. You can deal so much damage on classes like Arcane Blade in the first one or two turns. But on Corruptor, since you have to wait for the cannon part of your class, it's a bit of a different experience. Next time I want to be talking about either Bulwark or Berserker. I had a few requests for these classes. I'm currently leaning towards Bulwark. I think there's more going on in that class, but I'll see how it goes. So enjoy the rest of your day, night, morning, wherever you are, and thanks for watching.